I will talk about the folks that lived here with the name they probably gave themselves. Their tribal name was the people. The Navajos today call themselves Diné. The Hopis call themselves Nota. They both mean the people. I think it's more personal. I think it's respectful. It's a heck of a lot easier for me to say. So I'm going to tell you the story of the people who lived here. So I will use 19 different oral histories from the descendants of these people to create my story. And I say descendants because we know where they went when they left here in 1300. They went to Arizona to become the Hopi. They went to New Mexico to become the modern day Pueblo people. The Taos, Santa Clara, Santo Domingo, Jamez, all the way down to El Pisleta in, the, on, uh, in El Paso. There are 19 tribes, 19 groups of people that once lived up here. And so I'll blend their stories together to tell you how we think life may have been. I also take the way they live today, their modern day culture, and put it in there to make it more personal and up to date. According to them, like we have, the, have our story where we came from, the Garden of Eden or whatever, these people say at one time they did not live on the surface of the earth. They lived under the earth, what they call a third world. We are standing in the fourth world. 20, 30,000 years ago, we really don't know when. The Great Spirit told the people, you can come out from under the earth and live on top. You're now whole human beings. Because you have five fingers on each hand. And with five fingers on each hand, that makes you human. Only humans have that. For thousands of years, they roamed the northern plains of Arizona, New Mexico, southern plains of Utah, and over here in Colorado. They learned how to live. They learned how to clothe themselves, how to find food. The ladies would gather the nuts, the berries, the roots. Men would hunt the deer, the buffalo, the antelope, and little, little critters. They lived well up on the surface of the earth for tens of thousands of years as following the herds. Finally, somewhere around the year 450, according to the anthropologist, archaeologists, a group of them came to live up here on top of Mesa Verde. And instead of finding the dusty, nasty land down in Arizona, New Mexico, or over here in Utah, they found a lush green forest. Up here, there are literally dozens and dozens of plants you can eat. A couple dozen more that you use for medicine. So for 800 years of living up here, they build houses in the soil called pit houses. If you've not been to the museum or not been to the Mesa Top Loop to learn about the pit house or look at samples of them, please go and look. But for 800 years, ladies, you're climbing up and down the cliffs with a pot on your head, maybe a baby on your back to get the water because there's no water up here. You lived well up here, developed communities and neighborhoods and little towns and things like that, but every day we're back down and up, down and up. Now my wife's theory goes this way. My wife says that after 800 years, mama comes home and she says, I ain't happy. And ladies, when mama's not happy, nobody's happy. I can't hear you ladies, nobody's, 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 nobody's happy. <laughs> but the men being good husbands said, we will build you a new house where the water lives. Save you all that energy waste every day climbing up and down the hills. So you ready to go down and visit the water and visit the house? Yep. yep. Okay, we're going back in time 800 years. Every step down is a step back in time. So just imagine yourself 800 years ago with no cameras, no cell phone, <laughs> no computers, no cars, no gasoline, nobody bugging you except your mother-in-law. <laughs> Take a walk. Who wants to go upstairs and stand in the sun? Anyone? <laughs> stand over there? No, up there. Oh, okay. I think one reason they moved down here, conservation of energy. In the summer, it's cooler. In the winter, it's warmer than up above. We are standing at the water. It's not over here behind me. This is the water. The water is in the sandstone. This is Mesa Verde sandstone. It's the largest formation in the United States. It all goes all the way up into uh, Wyoming, goes over to Utah, 
down in Arizona and New Mexico. This rock is like a big sponge. When it rains, the water soaks in. When the snow melts, the water soaks in. And 30 to 50 years later, depending on where you're at in the park, it comes out here at a seep spring. This is one of two springs in this site. When the people lived here, none of this dirt would have been here. These plants would have been gone. It would have been a nice stone-lined pool with clear, beautiful water. We are, have, right now, there are 49 of us here. We represent the entire population of Balcony House. Plus a couple, give it, you know. This is one spring, it's probably 20, 30 gallons a day. The other one up is about, is running about the same. Now, it's this, these alcoves that we find these houses in are created by nature, by Mother Earth. In the winter, when the water in the rock freezes, it breaks off the stone. It's been happening for millions of years. These are still growing. That boulder has only been there for 15 years. He used to live up there. Every spring, we find big boulders falling. We find rock falling all the time. That one. Yeah. So, I want you to pray that while we're down here, nothing falls off the ceiling. This is the balcony I told you about. All the rooms that you're in this area, none of them have, have been rebuilt. The only thing we've done in this area, in 1920, 21, they reinforced that wall and they poured concrete floors up here, strictly for safety. These rooms, they're all original. Let's look at what we have. Where you came up, there were two or three rooms down there for storage. These are storage rooms. Those are doors, not windows. There was another two, two uh, rooms here, another room there. And uh, there's four rooms on the other side of that wall. This area was probably a work area that we're standing in for the men or the women. I want to talk about the construction. I told you they lived up above for about 800 years. They learned how to build their houses in the soil. In about the year 1200, the people started coming into the alcoves. Some had been living here for a couple hundred years already. <laughs> but they were living so well, prosper prospering so well, that some of the people came down here and they were full-time stonemasons. We think they had division of labor. And the reason I can make that statement is, look at the squareness of the stones, uniformity of size, absolutely perfect walls and 90 degree angles. In order to do that, you need training and experience. You also have to know how to shape a rock. They would go eight miles down the canyon to get rocks for hammers. They also went down the river down there to get the, to get the stones for axes. All this timber was cut down. The first wood was cut down around the year 1225. The last timber was cut down around the year 1270 give or take a few months either way. We've also found plum bobs. You guys know what plumb bobs, little thing you hang on the end of a string? I mean, look how straight the walls are. They invented tools. So we have dedicated labor here doing nothing with stone masonry. That means the people up on top are doing the hunting and the farming. And maybe some of these people did that as well. One of the theories for some of the people moving into their cliff faces, and only about maybe a third of the 3,000 people did. The rest of them stayed up on top, either living in pit houses or building stone houses like this. One of the theories is warfare. Oddly enough, we find no physical evidence of battle damage on any of the houses here or on the surface, nor do we find definitive evidence on skeletal remains of battle wounds. We do have broken arms, broken legs, and crushed faces. But that can happen if you fell over the wall. So we can't say definitively there was warfare up here. We think there was not. However, that doesn't mean this was not built as a defensive position. If you go back 1,800 years, 
China. A philosopher named Sun Tzu wrote a book called The Art of War. The very first principle to win a war is not having to fight one. It doesn't mean avoiding it, it means you just not having to fight it because you make it so expensive for the enemy to wage war that he's going to say to heck with it. That's what we did with the Soviet Union. I mean, can you imagine them 20 miles up the, over the top and over the valley there and have to come back all the way up here to steal a couple of baskets of corn? It's not economical for energy or resources. So maybe these are deterrents at work. Don't know. What we do know that we had two family groups here. They were probably of the same clan, and the rest of the clan members lived up on top. So harvest time comes, they gather the harvest, and the people down here store it for, it for them, and they take care of it. 